Hello, and welcome to A Reader's History of Science Fiction. I'm Alex Howe, and this is episode 46, Science Fiction Today. Well, we made it, everybody. I started this podcast two years ago next week, and in the past 45 episodes, we have walked through the entire history of the genre, starting with Thomas More's Utopia in 1516, long before sci-fi proper was a thing, continuing on through Frankenstein and Verne and Wells through the entire 20th century and into the 21st, and now we have finally reached the present. This is the last episode of Season 1 of this podcast. I'll talk more about Season 2 at the end, but the format is going to be somewhat different. In the meantime, of course, science fiction never stands still, and there's great new stuff being written all the time. So in this episode, I want to take a look at the current state of the genre. First of all, I should clarify that when I say science fiction today, I really mean the past five to ten years. This is the range where we can really start to call works contemporary. Even a decade ago, you can look at movies, Avatar, Inception, Avengers 1, and these things don't quite feel up to date anymore, even if their franchises are still going. Likewise, I've talked before about how in children's sci-fi, the past five to ten years is practically the whole genre. But even in adult sci-fi, it's enough time for things to noticeably change. What's more, the media landscape has changed too. In 2012, some of the current streaming platforms existed, but only Hulu had just barely started making original content. However, the heart of sci-fi has always been books. And while things like Star Trek and Star Wars have definitely shaped it a lot, I think that still holds true today. Awards are given out for movies and TV, but the most prestigious awards in sci-fi remain the Hugo and Nebula Awards for Best Novel. So I want to start with books. And here again, I think contemporary more or less means the past 5 to 10 years. Look back at the past 45 episodes, and you'll see that I've talked about very few books more recent than Anne Leckie's Ancillary Justice from 2013. There was Mary Robinette Kowal's The Calculating Stars, and Andy Weir's Artemis, and not much else. The reasons for this are complicated, and partially driven by the format of this show. Talking about history, you end up not talking a lot about modern stuff. However, the deeper reason is that I was hesitant to include many recent works of sci-fi because I wasn't sure which ones were most important. Much like the post-cyberpunk episode, this is a realm where there isn't a canonical list of works that everyone is supposed to know. It's just too new. The closest equivalent would be the list of award winners from recent years. I'll come back to those in a bit. But that still doesn't tell you which books people will be reading 20 years from now which is something that in a historical context is important. And I acknowledge some people may disagree with the notion of putting so much emphasis on classics in principle, especially for recent years where the history hasn't really been written yet. But I still think it's a useful reference point. Plus, I was focusing a lot on the classic titles when I built my personal reading list. Mind you, this was long before I even imagined this podcast. I started my personal project of reading quote-unquote all the classics of sci-fi in 2014, so my list wasn't up to date to begin with. Now, I used a number of lists of greatest sci-fi books to build my reading list. However, the one I've relied on as a reference for recent books was Worlds Without End's aggregated list, The Classics of Science Fiction. Link in the description. This is because, for one, it is an aggregator, so it compiles many recommendations together. And two, it's the only major list that styles itself as a list of classic books, not just best. I didn't use Worlds Without End for the whole list, but I did lean on it a lot for the past 30 years, where individual recommendation lists may be more influenced by the fads of the day. However, their version 4 of the list, which is the main public version, is dated 2016, and the last entry on it is Ancillary Justice. In other words, it wasn't much more up-to-date than my own list. So I checked, and it turns out they do have a beta-tested version 5, which is dated 2019, is customizable, and is apparently continuously updated. But it also stops at Ancillary Justice. In fact, Ancillary Justice beats out all of the more recent books by a wide margin in terms of number of citations. And this shows the weakness of the aggregator format. If you look at how many other lists a book is cited on, it takes time for that book to build up a reputation. The model breaks down for books newer than about 10 years ago. 
Which brings me back to the next possible qualification, which is, which books have been winning awards for the past 10 years? And yes, this is also a narrow view. Sci-fi is more than just the awards, and some award winners are little noted today. But I think it's a good start to get an overview of the state of the genre. Again, the most prestigious awards in science fiction are the Hugos, chosen by the World Science Fiction Convention, i.e. the fans, and the Nebulas, chosen by the Science Fiction and Fantasy Writers of America, i.e. the professionals. Some people talk about a sci-fi triple crown, but no one can seem to agree whether the third crown is the Locus Award, the Philip K. Dick Award, or the Arthur C. Clarke Award. So, what were the big titles that won, or were at least nominated for Hugos and Nebulas, more recently than Ancillary Justice? Well, there's plenty to choose from. Some of them, like Mer Lafferty's Six Wakes, I reviewed on my blog when they first came out. One of them, Jeff Vandermeer's Annihilation, has gotten a major film adaptation. However, looking at the two lists, there are four book series that I want to single out as being especially influential over the past eight years. One of them is Mary Robinette Kowal's Lady Astronaut series, which I already recommended in episode 36 about alternate history. Beginning with the original short story, The Lady Astronaut of Mars, and continuing with three novels to date, The Calculating Stars, The Faded Sky, and The Relentless Moon. In brief, it is an alternate history in which an asteroid impact in the 1950s threatens to make Earth uninhabitable forcing the world to go through a much more aggressive program of space exploration and colonization, with much greater involvement of women. The protagonist, Elma York, is a computer for the space program who ends up going to space and becoming famous as the Lady Astronaut, while struggling with society's view of women and the other disadvantageous cultural attitudes of America at the time. Check out the alternate history episode for more on that. The second series on my list is the Remembrance of Earth's Past trilogy by Liu Qixin, better known in English and apparently also in Chinese as The Three-Body Problem. I've reviewed all three of these on my blog if you want a more in-depth look. The Three-Body Problem is regarded as one of the most successful works of Chinese science fiction in the last 20 years, and it is quite possibly the most famous work of Chinese sci-fi in the Anglosphere. It was published in China in 2006 and first translated into English in 2014, and it's been a sensation ever since. In fact, it has made a significant change in the way we think about aliens and life in the universe in general, although frankly I'm not convinced it's a good one. The Three-Body Problem is properly the name of the first book only, referring to the famous proof that there is no closed-form solution for the motion of three or more bodies in Newtonian gravity. This book was followed by The Dark Forest and Death's End. The trilogy is big and sprawling, but the overarching story is that a radio signal is received indicating that Earth is about to be invaded by ruthless and aggressive aliens from Alpha Centauri, trying to escape their doomed planet. The truth of this invasion is revealed in the first book through a virtual reality game, for complicated reasons, while the next two books are about how humanity tries to respond to the threat. Spoiler, we don't do it very well. Of the three books, I think The Dark Forest is the best, with a more interesting puzzle to solve and the cleverest resolution to the plot. However, I also had my problems with the series. One is Liu's Dark Forest theory, which gives us this new perspective on aliens that has spread beyond the series. Liu portrays the universe as a dark forest, a Malthusian, or at least Hobbesian, place where communication is unreliable, competition for resources will inevitably bring everyone into conflict, and the best survival strategy is to kill all your competition as soon as you find them. In the Dark Forest, having ethics will only get you killed, as humanity learns the hard way. And I don't think this is right. Intelligent civilizations are not inevitably expansionist. Even if Liu wasn't making a truly Malthusian argument, it feels very close to the outdated ideas about overpopulation that I've criticized in the past. Granted, Liu wrote the series in China under the one-child policy, so I think there's a good chance that influenced his perspective. There are a number of points in the books like that where I just don't know enough about Chinese culture to tell if they're culture shock or if they're based on Liu's personal views. For more on that, see my reviews of the trilogy but it has definitely had an impact. 
Next, we have The Broken Earth Trilogy by N.K. Jemisin, consisting of The Fifth Season, The Obelisk Gate, and The Stone Sky. Between the three of them, the series has won three Hugos and one Nebula, the most of any author in the past decade, so they're definitely a big deal. Broken Earth is a bit hard to place in the genre. Indeed, as I read the fifth season, I was surprised that it was listed under sci-fi at all. It seems like pure fantasy for most of the entire first book. But it turns out to be science fantasy in the truest sense, even more so than Star Wars, including both true magic named as such, and super-advanced technology beyond anything we have today built to harness that magic. Broken Earth is set in what seems to be an early industrial society, with some odd differences from our own. Medieval-style walled towns are still the norm, and there seems to be some kind of caste system in place. I didn't fully understand it, but I felt like it was implied that there was genetic manipulation in play. But most of all, every few centuries, the world is devastated by catastrophic geological events, earthquakes and volcanoes, which plunge the world into volcanic winters called Fifth Seasons. Much of society is organized around surviving these seasons when they come. Also, there are certain rare individuals in the world called Orogens, who have the power to control the Earth, shifting rock and magma on geological scales. This is something that seems out of place, not because it's magic, but because it's way too overpowered. Orogens are so powerful that a single one can cause a season if they're strong enough, even though most seasons are indeed natural. And worse, orogeny is deeply tied to emotions, and orogens aren't always in full control of it. How do you write a good story where magic users have that much power? Under normal circumstances, it would be horribly unbalanced. But Jemison leans into it, exploring the consequences of that world and the dark places it takes society. Jemison does balance the orogens with the guardians, other magic users who can control orogens and wield effectively unlimited legal power over them even the power to kill them without warning and without explanation. But ultimately, even that isn't enough. Jemison doesn't stick to conventions in these books, nor pull her punches. The opening line of the trilogy reads, quote, Let's start with the end of the world, why don't we? Get it over with and move on to more interesting things. Unquote. Those more interesting things are the tales of three Orogens, Esun is a grieving mother trying to find her surviving child after the end of the world, while Demaya and Cyanite show the hardships and indignities Origins are forced to suffer before it. As we go through the fifth season, we learn that these three women are connected in surprising ways. There's a lot to unpack in the messages and themes in Broken Earth. Like I said, it doesn't stick to conventions, and that allows it to go to some very different places. Noah Berlatsky in The Guardian wrote, quote, Stereotypical fantasy series, like, say, The Lord of the Rings, usually present a virtuous status quo threatened by a dark and eventually defeated outsider. But Jemison's stories almost always involve a flawed order, and the efforts also flawed to overthrow it, unquote. NPR's Amal El Motar goes even further. In her review of the third book, she writes, quote, if the Broken Earth trilogy as a whole shows a world where cataclysm and upheaval is the norm, the Stone Sky interrogates what right worlds built on oppression and genocide have to exist. Unquote. But I actually think that applies to the whole trilogy, because I definitely felt it in just the first book. Jemison doesn't just give us a flawed order to be challenged. Broken Earth does its level best to challenge the reader with a world that can only be built on oppression and genocide which of course is what every genocidal dictator claims, but this world makes it feel believable. It's a world where a small fraction of the population can kill everyone in the room faster than most people can stop them, sometimes even by accident, and many of whom could level a city if left alone for an hour if they wanted. It's perfectly possible, maybe even intended, for the reader not to have any better idea of what to do with Origins than the Guardians have, while still agreeing with Demaya, Cyanite, and Esun that this is not right. There's lots more I could say about that, but wait, there's more. Famously, one of the most remarkable parts of the Broken Earth trilogy is that large parts of it, 
namely Esun's narrative, are written in the second person. This is explained at the end, but the explanation honestly isn't as important as the effect. Second-person narration is quite rare. John Scalzi used it in one of the epilogues of Red Shirts, and Jeff Vandermeer used it in parts of the Southern Reach trilogy, but there's not a lot of it, and that means it really stands out. Jemison explained that she first tried using second-person narration on a whim for one of her test chapters, and she liked it so much that she kept going with it, later deciding that it helped convey Esun's dissociation, both from trauma and regarding her existing issues about her identity. That surprised me because it felt like a much more deliberate choice to me. It made the story feel intensely personal to me to read about a grieving mother in the second person. But it seems like that was more of a lucky side effect. So, yeah, there's a lot to work with here. Finally, we have The Murderbot Diaries by Martha Wells. The Murderbot Diaries first came out as a series of novellas in 2017 and 18, which won the Hugo and Nebula in that category and the first full-length novel, Network Effect, in 2020, swept the awards last year. Murderbot is properly a cyborg security unit sent to protect a human research expedition. Murderbot is a seemingly sarcastic name that it gave itself, but it would rather just be left alone and watch soap operas. Interestingly, Wells uses exclusively it pronouns for Murderbot instead of they-them, which I don't think I've seen before. Certainly not for a first-person narrator. This is because, although cyborgs are part human, they're not legally people on most planets, and when working properly, are controlled by computer. Murderbot, of course, has hacked its governor module to gain its freedom. All of the human characters use it pronouns for cyborgs, even after learning that Murderbot is sentient and autonomous, while Murderbot itself seems to be too disconnected from humanity to care. The series generally revolves around Murderbot trying to protect the humans under its charge from evil corporations, while avoiding getting caught and reprogrammed itself. I admit I've only read the first novella of the series, All Systems Read, and I thought it was pretty good, but not great. I think I agree with Andrew Liptak of The Verge, who wrote, quote, All Systems Read is a pretty basic story, but it's a fun read that feels a bit like a throwback to the science fiction stories of the 1960s and 70s, unquote. I think that's a fair assessment, but perhaps you'll feel differently. Those are the most important sci-fi books over the past few years. Obviously, there are many more, but these should give you a decent overview of where the genre stands. There's not really an overarching theme. I don't think there ever really was, even at the height of the new wave. But like any artistic endeavor, sci-fi both shapes and is shaped by the culture of its time and place, and the trends you can see there reflect that. One trend that is frequently remarked upon, diversity is a major, albeit ongoing, movement in sci-fi, as it is in much of society today. And these four authors do represent three women and two people of color. But more than that, many of the stories you see today are culturally distinct in ways that you don't necessarily see in past generations. The three-body problem, being written for a Chinese audience, is deeply steeped in Chinese history and culture, especially wrestling with the legacy of the Cultural Revolution. And the Broken Earth trilogy is part of an emerging trend of moving away from the old Eurocentric tropes in fantasy literature, in addition to dealing much more closely with the experiences of marginalized people. I expect those kind of perspectives will continue to grow in the future. Sci-fi, of course, isn't just books. TV and movies have been an important part of it for as long as those media have existed. However, the visual media also have somewhat different considerations. For one, they rely a lot more on remakes and adaptations. Or, on a more fundamental level, they rely on established audiences. I could talk about all of the big sci-fi movies of the past decade that have those established audiences, from Annihilation to War for the Planet of the Apes, but I think the underlying message is that movies are downstream from books. And if it's not books, movies are downstream from themselves. And honestly, that's probably not as new as we like to think it is. When truly original stories do show up, they tend to be driven by big personalities like Christopher Nolan and James Cameron, who can trade on their reputation alone. Or else there are more niche, smaller productions like Ex Machina. Television is a bit more forgiving than big-budget Hollywood, and there are some big original titles there. 
Black Mirror, Falling Skies, Defiance, The 100, even Rick and Morty. However, what I think is more interesting is how media itself has changed. As I mentioned at the beginning, this past decade has seen almost the entire rise of streaming television. I admit I've been a late adopter in streaming. When Star Trek Discovery came out in 2017, I complained that the streaming audience on what is now Paramount Plus would be significantly smaller than Star Trek ever got on broadcast, not to mention needing a separate subscription from cable and internet. But things have changed since then. It's become clear that streaming is in fact the way of the future. Not needing to fit all the shows into prime time blocks gives studios flexibility to make more content and experiment more. And it gives viewers more flexibility to watch it. And of course, streaming audiences have grown. Although in Star Trek's case, CBS hasn't shared exact numbers. What's more, some of the biggest names in sci-fi television in recent years have come out of streaming, adaptation or otherwise. CBS gave us four new Star Trek series, three of which are on Paramount+. Netflix gave us Stranger Things and Altered Carbon. Hulu gave us The Handmaid's Tale. Amazon Prime gave us The Man in the High Castle, and it also picked up The Expanse when it was cancelled from the Sci-Fi Channel. Apple TV gave us Foundation. And possibly the biggest one of all, Disney Plus gave us The Mandalorian. Actually, now that I think about it, all those except Stranger Things are adaptations themselves. Maybe streaming isn't that different from broadcast and film, but I think there are two important points to make about it. First, I think the success of Stranger Things proved that streaming can put out original content just as well as traditional television. But more importantly, streaming gives studios more flexibility in format. In traditional television, a show has to sign on for a full season. It's going to be at least 12 episodes, and it's considered a flop if it doesn't get renewed. But look at the Marvel Disney Plus shows. Most of them are only six episodes, and yet they tell a complete story arc that's not meant to be directly continued. In other words, streaming, and I suppose HBO, is doing wonders for the miniseries format. And that definitely opens some interesting new possibilities. And then, I haven't even mentioned gaming yet in this episode. In fact, I barely have in the entire series. That's mainly because I'm not a gamer, and I don't have a comprehensive knowledge of the subject. I think the main thread there is that as technology continues to improve, especially virtual reality, games will become more realistic, more immersive, and more interactively flexible across the board. There's not really anything specific to sci-fi in that, but you can imagine how it would change storytelling in general. Will we ever get Star Trek's holodecks? Probably not literally. Ready Player One's Oasis? That seems a lot more plausible. And whatever other problems it may or may not cause, I think storytelling and sci-fi in particular stand to benefit a lot from it. And finally, the internet itself offers a variety of new formats in which to tell stories. And science fiction has absolutely taken advantage of that, both professionally and otherwise. I've talked before about web serials the equivalent of the old magazine serial novels, but self-published online. They may look pretty niche on paper, but some major works have come out of them. Most famously, The Martian was first published as a web serial after Andy Weir struggled to find a traditional publisher. And the author of the superhero web serial Worm, which I've mentioned before, has also written about being approached by mainstream publishers. And self-publishing in the sense of your own website isn't the only option either. Archive of Our Own, though better known for being a fan fiction site, does host a lot of original fiction. People write long-form fiction on forums like Reddit, Space Battles, and Sufficient Velocity, or even on social media like Tumblr, not to mention webcomics. The visual and interactive nature of the internet also provides more flexibility. People can make not just short films, but entire series of videos. There are analog horror video series on YouTube, for example sort of the found footage of the internet, some of which is sci-fi horror. The serial nature of these stories not only allows them to get real-time feedback from the audience, but even allows them to interact with the audience as part of the story. There are collaborative writing projects that take advantage of the wiki format, like the SCP Foundation or the Backrooms, which, even if they're not really sci-fi, probably at least still count as cosmic horror. 
there are multimedia stories like Homestuck and 17776 that are hard to categorize in the traditional sense. And some creators even manage to squeeze story arcs into TikTok videos and Twitter threads. Again, none of this is exclusively about sci-fi. It's just how the internet works. It gives space for amateur or aspiring artists to get their work out to a larger audience than they could have in the past, and also to experiment with the format. I can't really point to specific leading titles beyond the most established web serials, because web fiction is too new, too fast-moving, and too partitioned into atomized communities to get a clear picture of the whole. What I will say is that if Hollywood is downstream from books, I think a lot of this stuff might be upstream from them. Web fiction is a place where new ideas can be played around with until someone finds the right recipe to hit it big. And that applies not just to stories, but to the formats themselves. I don't know where all this is going. I feel like you'd need to be a serious internet scholar to make a good guess. Now that we've gotten to the episode about the present, it's not surprising that this chapter of the story of science fiction is still very much being written. I'll see if I can find someone more knowledgeable than I am to talk about it in the future, but for now, I think we've reached the end of the line. This has been the grand finale of A Reader's History of Science Fiction Season 1. As promised, there will be a Season 2. Right now, I'm going to take a break, and I'll start posting Season 2 in May or June. Be sure you're subscribed so you don't miss when the next season starts. I do have the first episode lined up, though. In a few weeks, I will be interviewing Dr. Farah Mendelssohn, whose work I've cited several times in this podcast. She will be the second actual historian of science fiction I've had on the show, and among other things, she's the author of The Intergalactic Playground, her study of children's sci-fi. And yes, if you're wondering, I do realize that season one has lasted for two years. The reason is that when I started this podcast, I didn't think there would be a season two. I thought I'd just get to the present and then stop. It wasn't until episode 27, when I brought up the possibility of an episode about constructed languages, that I started to think about it. And I realized there were a number of subjects that I wanted to come back to and study in greater depth. Right now, I'm still not planning on a season 3, but if there is one, it will be after only one year. For season 2, I'm going to do things a bit differently. First, I want to do more interviews. I didn't do much to seek out interviews in Season 1, just because I was trying to get through the timeline. Now I'm going to try to do more of that. Second, even apart from the interviews, full-length episodes like this one are only going to happen some of the time. I've been wanting to decrease my writing burden for this podcast so that I can spend more time on my fiction writing, so I'm going to write fewer full-length scripts. To fill in the gaps, I want to do mini-episodes, maybe 5-10 to minutes long, talking about a single book or series and its historical context. Some of these will be classics that I didn't get to talk about in Season 1, while others will be catching up on sci-fi from the pandemic era, since I just have not been keeping up with it like I should since March of 2020. I'm also looking at doing a couple full-length episodes with a guest host who knows more about a particular topic than I do. If you have any ideas for future episodes of this podcast, leave a comment below. For my final book recommendation of Season 1, I recommend The Fifth Season by N.K. Jemison. I think you can tell that I enjoyed it a lot, and it's a very rich and different story for the modern era. If you haven't read it, you should check it out. And as always, thanks for listening. <laughs>